The first time I came through here was on my motorcycle on my way to San Jose State in the late 60s. I got off my motorcycle at the Standard Station in downtown Paso Robles. It was blazing hot. And I go, why the hell would anybody want to live in this town? I still do my music. I keep after that. It's uh, kind of going to be part of my legacy, I guess, when I'm dead. I think someday that somebody will probably discover some of my tunes and realize I actually wrote a few good songs. And I keep after my winemaking and try to make the best wines I can and not be overly concerned about certain aspects of it. From KCBX in San Luis Obispo, California, this is Central Coast AVA. I'm Jason Lopez. This is a song named Slowtown Blues, written and played by our guest today, Dennis Degger. Dennis Degger was born in the same town as the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Cleveland, Ohio. But his family moved to Riverside, California when he was eight years old. That's back when orange groves dominated the landscape. In the late 60s, Dennis went to college in the Bay Area and on the side got into the guitar. But he realized he liked writing songs and recording the songs rather than performing them and found himself working in studios in Los Angeles, eventually establishing his own highly successful recording studio in L.A.'s music scene. Before we get into the interview, though, I thought there was one memory he had about that time, nothing particularly earth-shattering, but uh, it's, it's one of those things that's just interesting, a little piece of minutia that seems to give a little color to the story. I worked with Olivia Newton-John at my studio in the, in the late 90s, and she was the sweetest person I'd ever met in my life. She'd washed her own teacups after the sessions and did all this kind of stuff. And I said, you don't have to do that, Olivia. We've got somebody who'll take care of it. She goes, I'm just a, you know, a common girl from Australia, and you know, this is how we grew up, and I, I like doing it. It makes me feel good. And the same in the wine business, I think. And I'm, I hearken back to the fact that the people in Pass Robles who I've met are really nice people. Uh, the ones in the industry have, have really helped me. And... Um, you know, it hasn't it hasn't gone to their heads. It's not going to go to my head, I don't think either. So, so welcome, Dennis. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? How are you today? Doing well, and uh, great to have you here, Dennis, in the studio. You know, let's start from that opening clip on this idea of people in wine on the Central Coast. You know, for all the awards and for being named Wine Region of the Year a couple of years ago by Wine Enthusiast. The uh, down-to-earth character of the Central Coast winemaking community still seems to be pretty much intact. I mean, you can go into a winery, and there's a good chance that the winemaker might actually be behind the counter pouring. That's true. And, you know, what I've found is most of the winemakers are, like, really generous with their knowledge. And that's really helped me get launched because I could call up various people and uh, say, you know, I've got this going on. What should I do? Or what, what, what do you think is happening here? And they would be very generous with uh, opinions and advice. Now, when you set out to make wine, I mean, you've made award-winning wines um, in in a very short time. I imagine there are, there are folks that look at you and say, how the heck did that guy do this? I get that all the time, in fact. They say, how did you learn how to make wine? And you, how are you getting, uh, you know, golds and, you know, some nice scores? And uh, when you haven't been to Davis and you haven't done any of the technical background. Um, Is it one of those, I didn't know that I couldn't do this, so you... Just went ahead and did it, that kind of... Pretty uh, much. I just decided I was going to make wine, and I started making it. And uh, people seem to like it. And and it's 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 a lot of work. You know, I take it seriously. I want to make the best wine I possibly can. And uh, a lot of it's in the fruit, but there's also a, a certain amount of skill and art, artistic merit, I think, that goes into winemaking. I think it gets a little bit too technical nowadays in many cases, especially the big companies. Um, you know, they're looking at wine through spectrographs and all these other kind of things and analyzing every detail. And, you know, um, I'm basically a naturalist uh, winemaker. I don't uh, add chemicals. We we add a little SO2. That's about it. So did you become a wine lover and, and then have a change of heart about Paso Robles? I mean, how did you... 
How did you go from your first impression of it being a hot, dusty, forsaken place to uh, <laughs> to a place that you actually wanted to live in? Well, I've been interested in wine my entire life, or at least uh, since I was an adult. And I've traveled uh, fairly extensively, uh, Italy, Spain, parts of France, and uh, all over California in my quest for wine knowledge. Um, I started coming through Paso Robles in, uh, in the 90s, and I fell in love with the town. And I bought a piece of property there in 2003. What was it you fell in love with? Paso Robles intrigued me because it was uh, fairly down home when I just returned to this area in the 90s. Uh, it still felt uh, kind of rustic and bucolic, and then I liked that. It's lost a little of that charm now, but I guess it's been traded for a little more glitz. But it still retains a lot of, uh, you know, local quality and characters that I really like. A lot of the characters here are still around when I enjoy them. After you moved in, when did you plant the vineyard? I didn't, you know, I didn't uh, think I would necessarily get into the winemaking business at, at when I first got here. I bought a piece of property that was uh, usable for that, but I wasn't sure I was going to do that. I thought maybe I was just going to take it easy. You know, that reminds me of the Schwab commercial, you know, the one where the retiree is frustrated by his uh, financial planner proposing an investment in a vineyard. <laughs> and uh, I have been waiting for years to dredge this up for some wine story, and your story fits it pretty well. These financial services companies are still talking about retirement like it's some kind of dream. It's either this magic number I'm supposed to reach or it's beach homes or starting a vineyard. Come on, just help me figure it out in a practical, let's make this happen kind of way. A vineyard? Give me a break. <laughs> and you're saying, where do I sign? Exactly. <laughs> so how'd you get the idea to make wine? I happen to fall in with two fellas... Mark Goldberg from Windward Vineyards and Stefano Seo from La Ventura who basically kind of took me under their wing at the early stages and showed me the ropes. And do you recall when you first met them? What was that like? I uh, had met Mark Goldberg at a place called Vinoteca Wine Bar. And this was, uh, we started talking about, this was in two th early 2004. And uh, we started talking about politics, strangely enough. <laughs> and we happened to be on the same page. <laughs> So he kind of hit it off in that regard. And then uh, he started telling me about his wine company and invited me over, and uh, we just became fast friends. We're still very good friends now. You, your curiosity got piqued, and you said, hey, I think I might be able to do this. Well, how it, the initial uh, wine that I made in 2004 was... Uh, Stefan had some grape juice that he didn't really want to do anything with. He just said, I've got this juice, and uh, I don't really think it's that great, so I'm going to... And would you like to have it? So he gave me a few gallons of that, and we brought it over back to Windward and fermented it. And he showed me how to get it through secondary fermentation, malolactic, and the whole process. And uh, I got a few gallons of wine from that, and that kind of got me started. It was pretty good wine, huh? It, it actually turned out to be excellent wine. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like a golfer who went out on the very first day you ever golfed and just hit a nice perfect drive right down the center of the fairway and then hit the green on the next shot and you were in. <laughs> Pretty much. And then, uh, like I said, I've been able to stay in touch with those guys ever since and get uh, some advice and and uh, further further my knowledge base. Well, tell us a little about the growth of your winery. Uh, from there, how did you put it together? How how'd you uh, strategize to get to where you are now? Or was it just sort of adding one component after the next? There's a certain element of that. Um, I started making wine at a, pa a big outfit, Pastorables Wine Services, which is a co-op. I did, worked there for a couple of years uh, in 5, 6, and 7. And then in 2008, I got uh, my property. I got a bonded, had it bonded as an actual winery, and I started making my wine there in 2008. And I've been, uh, you know, like I said, making small lots of wine at that location ever since. Is it uh, a state wine? Are you buying any grapes, or are you just using the grapes that you grow? Most of my reds are estate wines. Um, I, this past, uh, in 2015, we actually sourced some white grapes. We've sourced some uh, Viognier and Roussan from the west side of Paso, and some I got some Chardonnay from Los Alamos, California. It's a new program, and uh, it's working out great because now that I have my tasting room in downtown Paso Robles, um, 
It allows me to present a wider basis of wines. You must be a very busy guy, though. I mean, you've got a vineyard, and you're making wine, and you're marketing it as well. I mean, um, so how's retirement going for you? I'm busier than ever. (laughs) You know, somebody once, uh, I don't remember who said that, uh, but uh, somebody who was wiser than me, I guess, one time said, that retirement's for people who don't like what they're doing. And I, I think that applies to me. So, Well, it sounds like you've just let this unfold. Like when you hit a fork in the road, you choose the, the more interesting path. It was kind of an unintentional route. It was kind of like my musical career. I started out as a singer-songwriter and ended up becoming a producer-engineer. Um, and that's not the route I originally planned on, but that's how I ended up. Well, let's talk about music and, and recording for just a moment. You ended up working with some pretty big names in uh, music, uh, Lee Rittenauer on the jazz side, uh, no doubt, uh, helping to record one of their big big albums. A whole list of top line talent. How did you get introduced to music though from a, from a young age? How did how did that happen? I took up the guitar at uh, age eleven. My father played the guitar. Um, he was a singer uh, on the radio before World War Two, and. Uh, he had a guitar that I could plunk around on. I didn't really take it seriously until I went away to college. And then I uh, started playing, uh, doing folk music, performing that in coffee shops and various types of venues like that. Yeah, wh- when was this? In the late 60s. In the late 60s. And what kind of music did you play? I played uh, acoustic guitar with a harmonica, like Bob Dylan style. <laughs> 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 Wrote my own songs, some of which I'm actually... Uh, re-recording right now, I've discovered some songs that I actually like, and I'm recutting them. Yeah, Bob Dylan once said that, uh, when asked a question about those songs that he wrote in his 20s, I don't even recognize, I don't even know who that person was, because it's not the person I am today, but he said, when I look back, I really like it. Well, I had this old uh, reel-to-reel with three-inch reels on it, and uh, mono, and I found these old recordings, and I transferred them so I could actually listen to them in uh, real time now. And I found some uh, interesting lyrics and chord changes. <laughs> Things that maybe you wouldn't think of today. That you... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but at heart, are you still the same guy playing music, wine tasting, revving up the motorcycle? <laughs> I know you want to get that motorcycle sound in this tin tape somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, uh, well, the, I think what's interesting about it is the visit that wine writer Terrence Jones did with you at your place to uh, talk about music and and see some of the gold records on the wall, as the song goes. Um, that piece starts off with a BMW motorcycle that looks a bit like a Harley. And in these radio pieces, we're always looking for some good sound. So what better way to start a segment off than with a uh, the sound of a motorcycle? That's a, that's a pretty beefy sound for a German motorcycle, I would say. Yeah, well, if I put the stock pipes on, it's not quite as, quite as loud. <laughs> you like to let people know you're coming. People do know you're coming, that's for sure. You were in the music business. Tell me about that. What were you doing there? I started off uh, attempting to be a singer-songwriter, and so I moved to Southern California. I went to a small studio to cut some demos, and I was talking to an old guy there, and he had a small studio on Sunset Boulevard called Studio 76. He essentially asked me if I was uh, interested in becoming an intern, and I said, no, <laughs> not interested. Uh, about three months went by, and I called him back, and I said, can I cut my demos there if I'm an intern? He goes, sure, once you learn how to run all the equipment. Within a, in a very fast period of time, within three years, I was working on major projects. At one point, I was working with all these heavy jazz guys, and I got disgusted with my guitar playing because I was working with, you know, Lee Rittenauer and all these Brazilian guys that were just amazing guitar players. And and I just threw my guitar, put it in the case, and pushed it under my bed for 10 years. I said, I can never be as good as those guys. I quit. (laughs) It's 10 years, your guitar under the bed. You're still working as an engineer, working your way up? Yeah, I went, was an independent engineer for quite a while, and then I opened up a studio in Burbank in 1987 called Red Zone Studios. So this is your own baby. You have your own uh, recording studios, all your own equipment. I'll show you pictures if you want to yeah, see it. let's take a look if you have some. You know, a good, a good analog tape machine, and we're talking about 25 years ago, 
was, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars know. dollars Did uh, Red Zone have a sound that you can think of? Not exactly. Um, Red Zone, we took over a building that was a former studio. Oh my gosh. That's a huge control board I'm looking at here. That is a 60 input Neve V. There's the actual recording room. We could put a, about a 35, 40 piece orchestra in there. That's a beautiful room. So we started losing some business to all these guys who had these little ADATs in their house. Then they'd want to come mix in my studio. And then at the same time, hip hop started coming in and they were making records for nothing, essentially. Who, who was making records for nothing? Dr. Dre came into my studio at one point. I just, I didn't even know this until recently. I went back and looked at some old documents and he was in there. Dr. Dre back in his early days, I guess. 1995 or 1993, oh, okay. whatever it was. Wow. We, had, we had Snoop Dogg in there, I think, a couple of times, but the point is, They'd go and record in the basically in some guy's bedroom or something. All they'd need was an 808 drum machine and they'd rap to it. And then they'd put out the records. So the record companies decided they weren't going to spend any money because that was becoming popular. Yeah. So we'd actually used to have good budgets for rock bands, like an unsigned rock band. They'd sign them and they'd give us real money. And say, here's 75,000, go make a record. You go, okay. So you recorded all these people in your studio? These people were all, yeah, all did Vanessa recording. Williams, Slaughter. Slaughter did two albums there. Wow. Kenny G, he worked there for a while. Kenny G, Platinum, Platinum record. You have No Doubt down here, that's something. No Doubt, they worked on their first album, their big hit for, for a few oh, days wow. there. Gwen Stefani was really nice. They were all very nice because their first album was a flop. They were on the verge of being dropped by the label. Oh man, when this came out, I remember the Tragic Kingdom was so huge. I mean, gigantic, multi-platinum sales. It's yeah. The garage? You want to go out here? Yeah. What well, is technically known as the barrel room? Oh. <laughs> so we're looking at how many barrels do we have here? About 14, I think. I'm a true garage yeast. Oh, a garage winemaker, absolutely. So your crush pad's outside. Yeah, this is, this is a bonded winery and tasting area, so we're allowed to do this legally here. This is my crush pad. We bring the tanks up here, and with the crusher to stemmer, we set it all up, and we process everything right here. That was Terrence Jones talking with our guest today, Dennis Degger, at his home and winery in Paso Robles. Well, Dennis, one of the things I thought would be interesting to explore in this interview with you is to bring music and wine together. Yes. And, and not in the way we might expect. It's not about uh, listening to music and drinking wine. It's about your expertise how to mix a record and how that is like blending wine. Well, I try to look at it, I don't want to say artistically, but that's basically how I look at winemaking. I mean, I take the wine to the lab and we make sure everything's copacetic as far as certain elements go. But um, making wine is improvisational t to a certain degree. I mean, you have a game plan you're going to go with. You're going to harvest your fruit at a particular bricks level or whatever and whatnot. And uh, there's parallels to that in music. Is I think the grape growing is kind of like uh, the composition of a song. And then the finishing product, of the bottling and stuff, is like the final mix. You know, you make the decision, this is the time to bottle. This is when it's tasting the way I want it to taste. Let's get it out of the barrels and into the bottles. And same with music. Um, there's, like I said, there's a lot of improvisation that goes on because you have to make split decisions in real time, because you're not sure how things are going to actually end up. You think you know how it's going to end up, but you really don't. I think that's the key, isn't it? You think you know how it's going to end up, but you really don't know how it's going to end up. You can't be too neurotic about the plan that you had going in and, and trying to stick to that plan all the time. You have to be willing to uh, change the plan. Well, here's the correlation for me. There were songs when I'd work with in, in the studio, whether I was producing, engineering, or even ones that I'd composed. And I'm thinking, this is going to be a hit song. This is going to be a fantastic song. And then they record it, and the recording just doesn't seem to have the magic. And the same thing happens with uh, wine. But it also works in the opposite direction, too, when you think, like, this isn't really that great of a song, or this wine may not be that great. And then five years later, you go... This wine's fantastic now, and I didn't think it was going to be, great, be a great wine, but it turned out to be one. It's really surprising the way that thing works. When Dennis sold Red Zone Studios, he didn't get rid of everything. 
He kept a small mixing board, some microphones, some cables and stands. He can still make a record in his home studio, and that's where we recorded this segment. This is his demo of how building tracks of a song is like blending wine. We start with the isolated track of the drums. Here's Dennis's version of Hank Snow's I've Been Everywhere, only in this case, it's I Drank Everywhere. We're just crushing the grapes here. Now we're pressing the grapes. And we're gonna start blending pretty soon. This is where music and wine come together in the blending phase here. You might have contrapuntal elements in music and in the wine. You might have a wine that's higher alcoholic, another one that's lower alcoholic. And when you get together in the end, you're getting your finished, your finished wine. It's a lot like music to me. I spent 25 years making records in the studio. And when I got in the vineyard, growing the grapes is like the compositional part. Blending the grapes is like the mix down. You're putting in layers upon layer upon layer by adding different grapes, different barrels, different textures. And what you're going for is enjoyability. You want to be able to drink the wine and enjoy it. In the end, it's all about what the wine tastes like, just like a record. People that like it or they don't like it. They don't want to know what's in the mix necessarily. They don't want to know what's in there. They want to know, do I like this wine? Is it hitting my pleasure senses? Same with music. In that regard, that's a similarity to me. Now we're back to the finished product right here. We've got two layers going on here. Basically two songs going on in the vocals. Now we're going to go to the outro, fade out. Now that's the finish in the wine right here. You're sitting back in your chair, going, yeah, that's really nice, I like that. Uh, can I uh, have some more of that? Are you going to cap uh, your your production at some point? Is it is is there a, a line in which you, um, if you cross, you 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 think, okay, this is just turning too much into a business and and less about making wine. I'm going to stop. Or is, is that something that you're not too uh, concerned about? Well, you know, we're only at around 500 cases now, so total production. I think uh, a nice point would be a thousand cases, doubling what we're doing now, and that would be plenty of work and uh, not too much insanity. Chasing paper and, and putting the sales hat on? It's, it's difficult to do the follow-up sometimes on some of these processes. Keeping after them and calling them up and saying, uh, do you need any more of my wine? So I don't, uh, that's not the part of the job I enjoy the most, is, is calling up people and saying, have you tried my wines? They're fantastic. I'd re- I'd, I think it's better for somebody else to say that type of a thing. It's kind of hard to uh, toot your own horn, as they say. But then maybe even more to the point, it's uh, you're getting pulled away from actual winemaking, right? I mean, your your original idea was to, to make wine, right? I mean, not necessarily build a, an organization. I don't really want to grow the company enormously and try to sell it off or whatever, like uh, the goal of people in their 20s and 30s when they're trying to build a company. You've already done that. I've done that. This is my second career, so I don't... Uh, I don't feel obligated to try to do that anymore. Um, I'm enjoying making some white wines, which is nice. I find that quite enjoyable. And uh, um, it's also been a challenge because it's a whole different technology involved. You have to, it's more equipment intensive to make whites than it is reds. So that's been a learning curve. But uh, I'm really surprised that the reception we've gotten on our 2015 whites have been fantastic. So for me, that was like the first time I made red wine. And so I've been really happy with it. You know where you're headed if you're not already there. Where? Cult wine status. <laughs> well, we're in a few nice restaurants in Paso Robles, and uh, in a few, we've been in various restaurants in different parts of, the, of California. You seem to certainly have a calm sensibility about all this, you know, living in Paso, the music, uh, the winemaking. You seem to be a natural at it, I mean, just having fun. Well, I I appreciate that uh, that uh, view of me. <laughs> I'm I, uh, maybe I'm not taking it as seriously as I should be. <laughs> 
Dennis Degger is the owner and winemaker of Domen Degger in Paso Robles, California. His 2010 Mojo Estate wine, a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Morvedra, and Grenache, got 90 points from the wine advocate in 2014, and his red wines garnered gold medals at the San Francisco Chronicle Wine Competition in 2012 and 2013. This is Central Coast AVA. I'm Jason Lopez. I drank all along this road. Cause I drink everywhere, man Drank the mountain air, man I drank everywhere, man Drank more than my share, man I drank everywhere, man I drank everywhere Been Adelaide, Anglin, Asuncion, Rich, Calcarius, Caliza, and Close, Saline, Van Dyle, Dooley, and Domain, Day, Eclipse, Epoch, and Follic, and Frog, Alteran, Harmony, La Venture, Jack Creek, Jade, and Lone Madrone. Cause I drank everywhere, man, drank the mountain air, man, I drank everywhere, man, drank more than my share, man, I drank everywhere, man, I drank everywhere. Mojo, Midnight, Opalo, Oso, Libra, Parish, Family, Peachy, Canyon, Pipe, Stone, Pianetta, Red Soul, Rockin' Isle, Rocky Creek, Water, One, Sextant, J-Lo, Star, Ranch, Stillwater, Summerwood, Thomas Creek, Terry Hope, Tobin, James, Van Two, Vina, Robles, Wild Horse, and Windward. I drank everywhere, man, drank the mountain air, man, I drank everywhere, man, drank more than my share, man, I drank everywhere, man, I drank everywhere. Belladonna, Booker, Carmody, McKnight, Copia, Chronic, and Chateau, the two. Neil Banner, Dark Scar, Claude Pierre, Curse Ranch, Hammer Sky, Herman Story, two. Law State, Hidden Oak, Liberty School, Castle Board, Mary Crescent, Silver Horror. Cause I drank everywhere, man. Drank the mountain air, man. I drank everywhere, man. Drank more than my share, man. I drank everywhere, man. I drank everywhere. Canyon, also leave a red soul, Robert Hall, Leonetta, Pipestone, River Star, Rockin' Hot, Windward, Mojo, Opalo, Terry Ho, J. Lord, Jacob Tall, Ken Polk, Shadow Run, Chale Oak, Silver Horse, Stack, Stone Star, Ranch, Steinbeck, Talbot Creek, Wild Horse, and Whale Bone.